And got in trouble. I'm supposed to stay on the mat. Low Zoom people, I'm on the mat. Okay. So I don't know about y'all, but I think the chef needs to open up his own baked potato shop for soup because that was yummy, yummy soup. So thank you, Arden Horse, for the food. Everybody enjoy the food. I go to a lot of places and they have wraps. I was so excited there wasn't a tortilla in the room today. Okay, everybody with us so far? Okay, so let's talk about some things that I want you to be aware of. This is what we train staff to be aware of. Just like UTIs, they've also got to be aware of delirium. Now, delirium is not dementia, although it can be caused by dementia, just by the dementia itself. And you need to understand what it does and what does it mean and why do we respond so quickly? And the reason we respond so quickly and I challenge you to find somebody in the medical field who knows this. What does delirium actually do to the brain? Why do we get so freaked out when we have a resident with dementia that are with delirium that we immediately send them to the ER? Do you know why? Delirium means the brain is not recognizing the brain's chemistry so the brain can shut down. That's why we respond so quickly. And your loved one is going to have delirium and it's going to present as they're suddenly different today than they normally are, or they're different this afternoon than they normally are. It has a very rapid onset. Now, there tend to be three forms, hyper, hypo, and mix. Hyper means your loved one is suddenly very agitated, physically, verbally aggressive, something that's completely different for them. Hypo means they're so lethargic that you can't get them awake. You, you To the point that we even have people that have had catatonic features to the point that the ER was certain the lady had gotten into medication and that's why she was catatonic. And she was catatonic because she was having this type of delirium. Delirium is caused, and something to remember is that it can last for days, weeks, or months. So just because your loved one's been released from the hospital doesn't mean the delirium is over. If you don't see them coming back to how they were before the delirium onset, you need to go back to the doctor and see again, because it looks, it would be that it hasn't cleared yet. It can um, be caused by drugs, by surgery, dehydration. Does everybody know how to check dehydration in an elderly person? Who told me to pinch skin? Okay, seriously, seriously, except for one person in here who's got a lot of collagen in their skin, the rest of us are white people, and this is what old white skin does. I didn't snap after I was eight years old. My snap went away. Okay, so we can't go up and snap. Plus, if you go up and do this to an old person with dementia, you're going to get slapped. Okay, we do a thumbprint check and kind Rachel's going to come up here and demonstrate for us. <laughs> Rachel's going, I am never sitting on the front again. Okay, so and I waited until she had her mouth full of cookie before I said anything. So come here where we're on Zoom so they can okay. All you're going to do is press between the eyebrows with your thumb very firmly. You should be able to feel the skull. You can't do it to yourselves. What are y'all doing? <laughs> Stop that. Okay, so I'm just simply going to ask Rachel, can I touch your forehead? She's going to say yes. I'm going to go one, two, three, four, five. And when I jerk my thumb away, if there's a white imprint where my thumb was. She needs fluids. She needs fluids, by the way. <laughs> okay, and that's the test. Don't pinch skin, you'll get smacked. The test is this. The darker the skin, the more quickly the flash will happen. So if your person has very dark skin, you've got to pay a lot of attention, but you're gonna press firmly, one, two, three, four, five, jerk your thumb away and look. If there is a white imprint where your thumb was, your person is dehydrated, okay? So you wanna push fluids on. Everybody with me? Okay, we think a lot about uh, low, low sodium, low salt, can set off delirium. We think a lot about high blood sugar or high blood uh, high blood sugar, but we don't think about low blood sugar or low blood pressure or high blood pressure. Then pain can cause delirium, especially untreated pain. Infection causes delirium, like urinary tract infections. That's why they work, sort of go hand in hand. And then dementia itself can cause delirium. So you may have a person that you've taken to the ER for delirium and the ER staff is very confused because they can't find one of these causations because they don't realize dementia itself can set off delirium. Does that make sense to everybody? 
So delirium means your loved one is suddenly different than how they normally are, okay? Now, do you think people with dementia have depression? How many of you have depression? As I walked around the room, I can tell you quite a few of you do. You've got to get on antidepressant medication. It will rebalance your serotonin. Without serotonin, you simply don't survive. And de depression is called pseudo-dementia because people with depression look like they have dementia because you can't think quickly and you can't concentrate. And because you're a dementia family caregiver, your first thought in depression is, oh crap, I've got it too. And what you have is something treatable. Okay, so you're going to do the geriatric depression scale, and that's going to be on your final slide or two will be all the things I want you to go look up. So people with dementia have depression. Do we agree? The form they have is the form called atypical depression. People with atypical depression are angry, annoyed, agitated, and aggressive. If we don't treat depression, a community can tell you you need to come move your loved one or you need to get 24-hour care, and what they really need to do is treat them for depression. Okay, the depressant uh, level is going to be higher, it's going to be a higher level drug typically than what you and I were ta would take a higher milligram, higher dosage, and it takes several weeks for the doctor to know if the, the depression antidepressant they're using is working, or if they need to make adjustments. So it may be that your person has to have two or three before they find the right one. Okay, so people with dementia have depression. The form of depression they have is the form called atypical, and an atypical person is angry, annoyed, agitated, and aggressive. Did I describe your loved one, your colleagues at work, or your boss? <laughs> All of the above is the most common answer given. Okay, a nausea is the inability of a person with dementia to realize their brain is not functioning correctly. So every time you tell me I'm doing something wrong, you're only going to make me mad. Now, there is a universal human behavior. This is all humans anywhere. If I came up to any one of you today who have been so pleasant, and I said in talking to you, you know, I don't think your mind's working correctly. Your instant response is to become furious. And your mind is working correctly. So what do you think happens when you keep pointing out to your loved ones that they're doing things wrong? You're going to get pushback and blowback. Stop telling them what they're doing wrong. Simply work around it. Remember the salt and sugar. If they ask for salt and you know it's sugar, hand them the sugar. It's not a teaching moment. Just give them what they're looking for. Does that make sense to everybody? Thank you, front table, for saying yes. There's things they can do and things they cannot do. Their reality is your reality. If my mother thinks the year is 1970, the year is 1970, and trying to convince her otherwise only makes her annoyed and agitated and less likely to in, uh, interact with me. We use empathy. We're not lying to people. If I tell Rachel something that's untrue, then I've lied to her. But your loved ones have brain damage. We are working with brain damage, so we use empathy. If they are looking for somebody who is dead, we're going to tell them that person's at work, that person's at the golf course, they're off playing tennis, they're doing whatever that person would have normally done. We are not going to bring them back to grief of your mother died 30 years ago. Well, now I got an upset person with dementia. I've got somebody who doesn't remember that, so that scares them. I've got somebody who just started grieving now because they, I've told them their mother is dead. And what good did that do me? That helped my ego, but it upset your loved one. Okay, you have to take your ego out of this. You are not going to make their brain start functioning. You cannot regrow their brain cells. Whatever they have in that moment is all they have that's functioning. Does that make sense to everybody? The brain runs the body. So as the brain becomes more and more damaged, the body works less and less efficiently. I have people tell me all the time, oh no, my loved one's really not that sick yet because they're in stage five and they weigh 200 pounds. Well, you know what? Stage six is where it happens. Stage six is where the body begins to be affected. And in the normal course of the disease, your loved one will lose one third to one half of their body weight. They are not healthy. Families will describe what their loved one is doing and then they'll go, but you know, they're okay. No, no. you didn't just describe okay. You described brain damage. And that's what we have to work with. Do you have a question? Yeah. 
because why? Because why? He has brain damage that's affecting his speech. What is a therapist possibly going to do for that? Yeah, we have, we see people with the family trying to do PT, physical therapy, trying to do speech therapy. They have a brain disease that's killing these areas. Why would you force them to do this stuff? We, we don't do that. Yeah. Yeah, it's not the doctor's husband. And is the doctor an expert in dementia? No, ma'am, they're not recalling their children's names because the cells that hold that child's information are dying. Okay, does that make sense? You sure it made sense? Okay. How many of you have realized this is big business? If I write a book on normal brain development, nobody cares. You write a book on dementia, that's a book. Does that make sense? Okay, you all right? Y'all good over there? Now they're just not even gonna talk to me. <laughs> That's how hard it is. Okay, things we can't do. You got to stop quizzing your loved one. We do something to these people who have brain damage that we wouldn't do to anybody else with any other disease. What is COPD? Where's my nurse? What is COPD? Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, it's lung disease. And what can people with COPD not do well? They can't breathe. Do you run up to your loved one with COPD and go, get up and breathe, breathe for me. Come on, breathe. I've seen you breathe. <laughs> Blow up these balloons. We're having a party later. Let's see you do it. You used to do it. Blow up the balloons. Would we do that? And if you did that, would we think y'all were crazy? You seen somebody with amputated legs? Do we go up to the person with amputated legs and say, run down that hall? You used to run, run down that hall. You're pretending you can't run. You still have stubs, run down those little stubby legs, go down that hall. Would we say that to a person with amputated legs? What do we do to people with brain damage? Who am I? Tell me who I am. You know who I am. And I'm right in your face and my voice is getting agitated and I'm quizzing you. You know who I am. Tell me who I am. Oh, wait, I'll get a picture. Here's the picture. Here's the picture. Do you see the picture? Who's in this picture? Do you see the picture? Who are these? You know the face in a picture is about this big? And they've already got vision impairment. And now you're demanding they use the organ in their body that doesn't function. But you would never do that to somebody with COPD or somebody with amputated legs. And you do it because you're human and because humans teach and because you love this person and you think if I just do it one more time, they'll get it. So I was a social worker. I was in a nursing home and I began to realize that these people had something wrong with them. And this one lady, it was so obvious. She was in a wheelchair and she would pull herself along the handrail through the whole nursing home and the nursing home took up a block. It was huge. And I decided I could... I could do something with her. And this was when, before we really began to study dementia, before I knew anything at all about what I was doing. And I must have spent hours saying her name to her, trying to see if she would say it back to me. And now I realize what a horrible, horrible thing I did to this woman, thinking that I was being helpful. So you're doing simply what I did before I realized differently. They have brain damage. Every single moment, they're doing the best they can. So when I go up to my mother, I don't go up to my mother and say, do you know who I am? Tell me who I am. And you begin to get an edge in your voice that she very clearly hears. Instead, I come up every time and I'm like, mom, it's me, Tam. I'm your favorite. I'm the good looking one. I'm the smart one. I'm the one you always liked best. I mean, I might as well get in a good point for me, right? And when she no longer remembers my name, it becomes Margie, I'm Tam, I've known you forever. Feel like I'm related to you. I'm going to give her clues that socially say I'm okay to talk to, but I am never gonna come up and demand she tell me this because she can't. Now that doesn't mean five minutes from now, she won't look at me and tell me to go clean my room and know my name, right? Because the brain kept trying to find a connection. 
that I am going to get a better response by using my social skills and by giving her the answers. So train your children, train your grandchildren, train your friends. I'm your neighbor. We used to barbecue together. Oh my gosh, you make the best barbecue. I've given that person a whole bunch of clues as to who I am and how we know me. And who knows, maybe I'll clue something on barbecue. I mean, we are in Texas. We're the only people that will drive four hours on a rumor of barbecue at an old gas station, right? <laughs> so use those skills and you've got to teach your family. I can tell you as a professional, nothing makes professional building people more angry than you visiting your loved one and quizzing them. Because when you leave, you're upset because your loved one got angry. And then your loved one getting angry meant two people got angry and then four people got angry and then eight people got angry. And now our whole building's out of control because of what you did with your loved one. Instead of recognizing they're doing the best they can. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so no quizzing. So what is memory? You have long-term memory, short-term memory, and sensory memory. What is memory? Okay, I'll tell you since you're not going to give me the answer. It's your ability to re retrieve, recall, and store information. When you learn new information, an electrical signal and chemicals go to your hippocampus, the little horseshoe, not horseshoe, uh, seahorse. It goes to the seahorse, and the seahorse decides whether or not it's information you need. And then the seahorse decides which lobe of the brain does this information belong to, and it fires up a system and a structure, and it sends more chemicals and more electrical charges to that brain cell or that group of brain cells, and that group of brain cells grow a little more root to add in that information. And then as those brain cells begin to die, they don't die like that. Some of them die very, very slowly, and bit by bit, the root goes backwards, and that's why memory is lost in a backwards uh, fashion. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, memory is divided into sensory memory. Sensory memory is you were a little kid, your mom said, don't touch that, it's hot. You didn't know what hot was, you touched it. You found out what hot was. Nobody ever had to tell you again, don't touch that, it's hot. Short-term memory is what you're gonna use on your way home. Short-term memory is telling you watch out for that car, that car's coming up too quick. The roads are slick, I gotta watch out. Oh, that truck's changing lanes. Oh, hop, 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 hop. And then when you, mine's very highly attuned to cops. When you get home, you sit and think and you go, you know, I don't even know if I stopped at the stop sign because your short-term memory used that information for the second you needed it. And then you didn't need to know about stop signs again, so it threw it away. That's much different than you getting home tonight, your daughter calling to tell you she's pregnant. It's triplets. They're due on Easter and she's going to name them Huey, Dewey, and Louie. That your hippocampus will grab and move into long-term memory because that's going to be family information that your brain needs for the rest of your life. Does that make sense to you? Three people shook their head. That's all I need to go for. Long-term memory is divided into declarative memory. Declarative memory is what we learned at school. They taught us a whole bunch of stuff and then we had to be able to give it back to them. This is your education. This is your job. Procedural memory is your activities of daily living. Now you started your activities of daily living as soon as you were born you begin to start to function towards this. And your first activity of daily living was your ability to transfer. Those of you who are parents know this as the day the baby turned over. The day the baby turned over was their first transfer and it was such a milestone, you called someone to tell them the baby turned over because it's the big developmental milestone. Then you begin to learn to ambulate, to walk. But you didn't just start walking. I have people tell me all the time, I was walking when I was nine. No, you weren't. Nobody nine months old was walking. You may have been standing and pulling up and beginning to balance, but there are a multitude of steps before you got to ambulation. Toileting takes dozens of steps. You have to recognize that pressure means you need to find a bathroom. Bathing is our most complex ADL. It took you until you were eight, nine, or 10 before your mother knew that you could safely and successfully bathe yourself. Now, something happens to boys at 14, 15. I can't help you with that. I don't, I don't study that, I don't care, okay? So procedural memory are our activities of daily living. Transfer, ambulate, toilet, bathe, groom, dress, and eat. What you did this morning. Semantic events are the things that are not personal. These are numbers, facts, and concepts. Episodic events are memories you have with emotion. It could be a birthday party, it could be a holiday, it could be a funeral. Okay, it's memories with emotion. 
Everybody with me? Okay. I don't know what's on this next slide, so I have to wait. Okay, here we go. So think of every memory you have as being a file. Okay. If you grew up in Minnesota, if you grew up in Texas, how many of you can drive? Keep your hands up if you can drive. How many of you can drive three on the tree and four on the floor? A clutch. Oh, sure, you can drive it, but you didn't know what it was called. Sure. <laughs> How many of you can drive in rain? I hope so, or you'd be spending the night at the church. How many of you can drive in snow? Ice. How many of you could drive in ice, but your brain wisely says, ice, bad, don't go there. But you work in dementia care, so your boss says, ice, bad, be careful coming to work, and you might want to bring a change of clothes. They make you spend the night in a dementia community. How many of you can drive an 18 wheeler? A truck pulling cattle? A riding lawnmower? I just threw that in there to make you feel better. How many files do you have on driving versus somebody from New York City who's never even been in the front seat of a car? Okay, so think of every memory you have as files. Now, the next thing families say is, yeah, but how come she knew it one minute and not the next minute? Your files are very complex. Let's look at the word banana. Banana is one of the first foods you got to eat on your own. They let you hold it and you squeeze it in your little fingers and the little banana ran out. And then they, you found out you could peel a banana. You found out in cartoons, a banana peel means somebody's fixing to fall down. A spotted banana means a bad thing. Then you found out monkeys eat bananas. I'm 60, I grew up, there was a TV show called The Monkeys, they acted bananas. So now bananas is also in my crazy file. Bananas are also in a sexual file. They use bananas to show boys how to use condoms. You didn't realize banana was in a sexual file, did you? You can bake a banana, fry a banana. You can make pudding with it. You can make cake with it. You can make bread with it. Banana is not simply in one file. So think about how complex your brain files are on the word banana. How thick do you think they are on the word mother? And remember, there's also a mother word that's over here in cursing. But Samuel L. Jackson knows that you're not allowed to use it, okay? If you're Catholic, the word mother also has religious connotations and files for Mother Mary. So think about all of the complexity of everything you know. It's the same thing with your loved one. So my mother may be able to respond one time, and then the next day that memory's gone forever. Or she responds, then has weeks where there's nothing, and then all of a sudden banana pops out again. Does that make sense to everybody? So it's not being done on purpose, it's where these files are. Does that make sense? Nobody said yes, but I moved on anyway. Did you notice that? Okay, I'm gonna use a file cabinet to explain memory to you. And this is in your itty bitty dementia book, which you have on your stick. That sounds almost nasty to say, doesn't it? <laughs> and we're in a church, so shame on y'all. Okay, I'm gonna use my mother. My mother is 82 years old. My mother was born at home on what is now Fort Hood, Texas. My mother was an only child until she was six and she's got a set of twin sisters. Those are her only siblings, but my mother comes from a very large family. She had 63 first cousins. I know. One of them was here earlier and left. Seriously, one of, one of my cousins was here earlier. My mother learned the same things all of us learned, the same things she taught us, the same things you were taught, the same things you taught your children. She learned home, mom and dad, please and thank you. And social skills started the day you were born. The day you were born, someone shook your hand. I had um, two great, a great niece and a great nephew born this year because we're up to 21 on, the, on their, the great nieces and nephews. My mother told them you're appropriating yourselves right out of Christmas. And three of them raised their hands to tell her they were pregnant. So we had two babies born this year. And um, I don't remember why I was telling you this. Oh, I know why I was telling you this. So because of COVID, we're at the hospital. And when Conley was seven days old, I went to her house to see her. And as I was leaving, her mother held her up like this and took her little arm and said, Conley, wave goodbye to your Aunt Pam. Social skills started as soon as you and I were born. By the time we were two, you and I were learning the social conversation. And the social conversation is, hi, how are you? And what do you say? And why do you say fine? Because your mama told you nobody cares. 
I'm not asking because I actually care. If you told me how you were really feeling, I would run away from you because that's not the social conversation. The social conversation is, hi, how are you? Oh, I'm fine. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. How's your family? Oh, they're fine. Wonderful. Mine is fine. How is work? Work is fine. My work is fine. How's the weather? The weather is fine. Because of the social conversation, your loved one fools people without intending it. You have family members who call from out of state and they have the social conversation with your mother and then your mother hangs up the phone. She doesn't even know she was on the phone. She doesn't remember the conversation. And your sister calls to chew you out and tell you she doesn't know why you're pretending mama has dementia. She just talked to her on the phone. And you know what? She's just, and the reality is she isn't fine. She simply responded to the social clues. Where's the other place you see the social conversation? At the doctor's office. And they walk in and what do doctors wear? Same uniform for 100 years, a white lab coat and a stethoscope. And the doctor walks in and says, Hi, how are you? And your loved one immediately went, I'm fine, how are you? And you went, oh, how come the doctor doesn't see it? Because the doctor doesn't realize social conversation is old, long-term memory, and they will do it until the very end. My mother learned grandparents. She learned family, cousins. She learned her church and her religious beliefs. She began to learn singing. She began to learn cursing. So they sent her to school. She went on a bus to a school with 15 rooms, one for each of the 12 grades, one for the nurse, one for the cafeteria or for the kitchen, and then a cafeteria library combo. My mother played point guard in basketball. My mother was raised on a ranch. She was the homecoming queen. She was a cheerleader. And the day after she graduated high school, she married my father. By the time, I know, I wouldn't encourage that today. <laughs> By the time my mother was 30, she and my father had five small children, and I would be 10, okay? From those children, my mother has 12 living grandchildren. From the first seven of those grandchildren, she has 21 great-grandchildren, okay? There we go with the great-grandchildren. But now, because of dementia, my mother doesn't realize the year is 2022. My mother thinks the year is 1970. So that means my mother doesn't understand how to use a walker. It's not that she's refusing to use a walker. It's not that she's refusing to do physical therapy. Walkers didn't exist until the 1970s. In my mother's brain, she never saw a walker before. But she can use a cane. Why can she use a cane? When's the first time you saw a cane? Back with your grandparents. How many of you stole the cane? How many of you shot bad guys? How many of you did a little baseball, a little golf? Then they took the cane away from you, didn't they? You were messing with those canes. So physical therapy is going to tell me my mother refuses to do physical therapy. She's not refusing anything. She doesn't understand what they're trying to get her to do. Does that make sense to you? Okay. My mother no longer recognizes a cell phone. In 2007, something amazing happened. We got iPhones. And in that same year, flat screen TVs that had been $7,000 were now $1,000. So we all got a flat screen TV. And with the flat screen TV, for the first time, we all got a clicker. So it is not at all unusual for somebody with dementia to come to us and hand us the clicker and tell us it's broken, it won't call their daughter. And then five minutes later to come back with their phone and say their phone is broken and won't turn on the TV. Okay, that is agnosia, the inability to recognize common objects or people. Okay, and it's because she no longer has those files. So my mother thinks that she's a 30 year old woman. So when I go up to my mother and say, I'm your daughter, what does she say to me? No, she's 30, she has five children. So when I go up to her and say, I'm your daughter, what does she say? No, you're not. Why am I not her daughter? Y'all are so sweet. Thank you, sir. Are you from New Jersey? Normally in Texas, you have to just drag out that part about I'm too old. This group over here was sitting here going, well, you don't look 10. Um, she's looking for someone else. And then finally, blue shirt goes, because you're too old. Which is what, if I was in New Jersey, everybody would have said in unison as I asked that question. Okay, I am too old to be her daughter because her files only go up to me at the age of 10. Who does my mother think I am? She knows she knows me. I get in her personal space. I fix her hair. I do her lipstick. I put her scarf on. She knows she knows me, but there's no file of me as an adult. So she's going to give me someone else's file. 
whose file do I get? You didn't ever skin your knee and run home yelling, sister, sister. Who does she think I am? Her mother. And that's why the dementia community wants so much information from you. If you knew my mother's history, you would know that at 60, I'm the age her mother was when she was 30. And I look like that mother. I favor my grandmother. So she thinks I'm her mother. Is she doing this to embarrass me? Is she doing this because she's been waiting 40 years to get me back for coming in late in high school? Or is she simply responding to the files at work? Hey, my mother's got an 85-year-old man living with her. My dad, who does she think he is? A grandfather. Another reason we want your history, my mother had both grandfathers live with them while she was growing up. Okay? Who does my mother think my brother is? Her husband. So here's a general rule of thumb. When daughters realize that daddy thinks I'm mama or mama thinks I'm grandma, you get it. You're pretty cool with it. When sons think, oh my God, my mother thinks I'm dad and wants to have sex with you. <laughs> no, she's just trying to put you in a place that makes sense to her. Now, if you're the son and you and your wife have taken your mother to live with you, eventually that's not going to work well because eventually you're going to become her husband and now you've brought your strumpet home and you're living with her in my house and sleeping with her and that should not be happening and she wants your wife gone. So men tend to freak out because they think it's sexual. It's not sexual. She's trying to put you in a file that makes sense. And how many of you know a son who is the spitting image of his father? How many of you know a son with the same name as his father? My mother's looking for five children. She has three groups to choose from. She has her actual children who are adults. She has her grandchildren, and with the exception of the final two, one's a sophomore in college and one's a sophomore in high school, the rest of them are grown. And she has the choice of 21 great-grandchildren whose ages are four months to 17. Who does my mother think her real children are? Which group? The greats. Why the greats? They match the timeline of where she is now. And what about all the extra ones of us? She had how many first cousins? And we have double cousins. Do y'all know double cousins? My grandmother and one of her sisters, she married my grandfather and her sister married one of his brothers. So we have people with the same DNA. So we do look a lot alike. My mother says our family tree didn't fork enough. It gives you a better <laughs> idea. Okay. So my mother is trying to put us in files that make sense to her. She's not trying to hurt our feelings. She's not doing this on purpose. You're simply witnessing what happens as the brain dies. Does that make sense to everybody? Dementia never quits. Your loved one has fewer brain cells tonight than they had this morning. Okay. As the disease continues, I go to my mother and I say, I'm your daughter. And my mother says, I'm sorry, I've never been married. Where is she now? High school. Right? Can I have a conversation with her? Absolutely. Can I have a conversation with her about what's it like to be a great grandmother to 21 little kids? It's like a school bus drove up to the house, honestly. My mother told me in the beginning when the first great grandchildren would arrive, she said I would run, flitting like a butterfly. She said later on, there became so many of them, I just realized I was trying to run, get over the fence, get into the pasture, hide by the river. Okay. Y'all with me? So I can talk to my mother about playing point guard. My mother grew up on a ranch. She knows how to milk a cow, how to make butter, how to make bread, how to make preserves. She knows how to brand a cow, how to castrate a bull. I can have a great conversation with my mother as long as I stay in her timeline, as long as I respect her file cabinet. Does that make sense? And what happens if I try to convince her she's something else and the year is different? I'm gonna get a very agitated person. Okay. The disease continues, and then finally, where does everyone with dementia want to go? Home. Do you remember when you were young and foolish? You had a new niece or nephew, and you brought them home with you. They were like two, so they let them leave the house. And they loved you. They loved you the whole way to your house. They loved you when you got pizza for them and watched a Disney movie, and they had a bubble bath, and you made popcorn. They loved you. 
until 8.01. And what happened at 8.01? They wanted to go home. When they said that, did you scream at them and tell them to shut up, this is home, this is where you've lived for 50 years, you made this deal with me, this is where you are, little person? Or did you try to soothe them? Because you realized they were scared and they just wanted to go home. How many of you got so tired of listening to I want to go home, you actually loaded someone up, put them in a car and drove them somewhere to a ranch in West Texas. And when you got there, you found out that ain't home. Because home is not a tangible building. Home is a group of things that are helpful for us. And I'll give you that list in just a minute. How many of you are being shadowed? Being shadowed means you can't move without your loved one right there by you. Your stress level is higher than others and your risk of death is higher. Everybody needs to be able to go to the bathroom in privacy. And if you're being shadowed, this is not undying love. This is old emotional memory. You're doing stuff that makes this person believe you're their mama. Do y'all remember having a kid that you needed to drop off somewhere and you couldn't peel that kid off your leg? How old was that child? They were two or three or four. And that's now the age IQ ability of your loved one. And that's why they're shadowing you. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So which one is the real TV for your loved one? We made a big jump. Do y'all remember how your mother changed the channel when you were growing up? How'd she change the channel? Told you to get up and go walk over there and turn it, didn't you? And how many channels were there? There were three, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And what time did they come on? Six, and what time did it go off? And what did it do before it went off? <laughs> they played the national anthem or they did that poem about high flight. You remember that? So which one is the real TV? And remember for some of you, You've got a flat screen TV and your person's got visual damage and they've got brain damage. They'll look at a flat screen TV where people are actual people size based on the shot and tell you that's a group of people standing over there and they're pointing at the TV because that's the TV they're looking for. When the TV signal got fuzzy when you were a kid, what did your mom do? Really, your mom did that? Yeah. And if the rabbit ears didn't fix it, where'd she send you next? Outside to a giant metal lightning rod. You realize now, your mom's been trying to get rid of you for a long time. <laughs> Which one is the real phone? Do y'all remember that phone there in the middle on this side, the one you had, what room did it hang in? Kitchen, did it have a cord on it long enough to go outside and rope cattle if they came by? That's a lot different, right? Do you remember the one in the middle on the top? It weighs like 40 pounds. Do you know why you can't find them? The government took them and used them to make army tanks during World War II. That's how heavy those things were. How do you wash clothes? My grandmother grew up doing all of those things and I remember her ringer washer. If you ever want to have a conversation with someone with dementia, ask them what a ringer washer is and what you don't do. What do you not do to a ringer washer? And you'll be amazed how many of you stuck your hand in it anyway. They told you not to, and you did it anyway. And that's much different than what we see now as our washing machine. Another thing, your mother didn't do her underwear, her unmentionables with the laundry. Those were hand washed. What do you think she's doing with her depends? They will continue to hand wash their diapers and try to dry them and put them back in the drawer. Okay. And that's not doing something weird. She's trying to wash her underwear because she's back in this time. Does that make sense? And my mother's 82 and they didn't have indoor plumbing until she was a senior in high school. So don't assume your parent had indoor plumbing. Which bathroom's correct? For my mother, it's that outhouse. Now, we didn't have indoor plumbing across the U.S. until 1974. Arkansas was the last state to get finished. I have an Arkansas joke if there's no one here. Oh, because you're from Arkansas. Never mind. I won't tell the joke. 
My mother grew up bathing in a number five wash tub. Okay. My mother used an outhouse. When they brought indoor plumbing in, we stood across from your house and looked at you and went, how nasty those people are. They're going to do that in the house where they eat and sleep. And now that we all have indoor plumbing, we see an outhouse and we go, how nasty is that? My mother had rich cousins. They had a two horse. You gotta love somebody a lot to say, hey, I'm going to the outhouse. You wanna come with me? Yeah, that's a lot of love right there. So what you and I see as a normal bathroom doesn't make sense to my mother. Okay, does that make sense to everybody here? Now, if your loved one has to have anesthetic surgery, you need to ask the, the surgeon, is there a different way to do the anesthesia? because your loved one will not come back the same after they have anesthetic surgery. And the easiest way for you to explain this to your family is puddles and potholes. When it finishes raining today, where will water be standing? In potholes. Your loved one's brain is now full of potholes. The easiest way to explain it is their brain doesn't clear the anesthesia, it stays in the potholes and that's why you see it such a decline, okay? That's why you sometimes will have a person who needs surgery and because of their dementia, the doctors won't do it because it will cause such a significant decline. It will be the same as death. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Now, these are the nine most common forms of dementia. And for some reason, my home slide wasn't in there. So let me tell you the seven things that make home home. And this is what you're going to do when your loved one moves into a community. The first thing that tells you your home tonight is your pillow. What kind of pillow do you sleep on? Is your pillow gel? Is it foam? Is it one of those hot, cold pillows? Is it feather? Is it down? Is it cotton? My mother told me once she'd drive 600 miles to get home to her own pillow. And how many of you have ever seen an industrial medical pillow? It's a piece of foam coated in plastic. I ain't sleeping on it. You wouldn't want to sleep on it either. First thing that makes home is the pillow. The second thing is the sheets on your bed. What type of sheets does your loved one like? Are they silk? Are they satin? Are they cotton? Is it flannel? What color of sheets does your loved one like? I don't like white sheets. I didn't grow up on white sheets. Every hotel in this country, guess what color the sheets are? I sleep on a gel cold pillow at home that's made for somebody that sleeps on their side. I stay in nice hotels. I haven't found one of those pillows yet. The third thing that makes home home is your bed covers, the thickness and weight and feel of your bed covers. I have two quilts from my grandmother on my bed at home and a uh, down comforter. My bed covers are this thick. I stay in nice hotels. The bed covers are this thick. Got the wrong pillow, the wrong sheets, and the wrong bed covers. Do I ever feel like I'm at home? No. The next thing that makes your home home is your art. Think about the last time you moved. You had the boxes done, the beds were made, the closets were done, the kitchen was put away, but you didn't call it home until you hung your art on the wall. Now, Sean will be the first to tell you, don't bring the Michelangelo to the building. We're sloppy people. Somebody will do something to it. Bring the fake one, okay? But art is very important. Your chair. Everybody in here has a chair. Your children know that's your chair. Your spouse knows that's your chair. Everybody stays out of that chair. That's your chair. Sometimes because of where I live, I don't get home till four in the morning. I am exhausted, but I sit in my chair before I go to bed. That chair tells me I'm home. The next thing that makes home home, what did I do? Pillow, sheets, bed covers, art, chair, family photos. But my mother doesn't recognize all those photos. So her family photos are the pictures of her grandparents, her parents, her siblings, as they were younger, because that's where she is now, okay? And the last thing that makes home home is a smell. But you and I don't know what that smell was, but you know their favorite cologne or their favorite potpourri or their favorite perfume. When you bring that to the community during the day, we'll spritz it on the lamp, we'll turn the lamp on and their room will take on an odor that you know they love. And those seven things are what actually make home home, okay? All right, you ready to do the nine dimensions? Oh, first we're gonna do stages of dementia. So in your thumb drive, in the final chapter will be the staging tools. And you're gonna to fill out those tools because they help your doctor understand 
where your loved one is. And those tools include um, the dementia behavioral assessment tool, the one for FTD is a separate staging tool, the instrumental activities of daily living and the activities of daily living scales are in there and you'll fill those out for your doctor, okay? You and I are stage one. We're stage one because we're aging normally, not because we think we're gonna get dementia. Remember, dementia is not normal aging. It is considered a disease of aging, but not normal aging. Most of us will never need care. We will never have someone assist us. Most of us will live and die at home. We will not develop dementia, okay? So let's talk about what dementia is and what it isn't. How many of you have walked in a room and don't remember what you went in there for? And because somebody in your love that you love has dementia, your first thought is, oh crap, I've got it too. And the reality is that's normal brain function. It just means whatever you're looking for, your brain doesn't care anymore, it's done, okay? That good looking actor, you saw the movie last night, you can see it in your brain, but you can feel the, <laughs> three in the morning, you yell Brad Pitt. That just simply has to do with how you learn the information. When I learned Brad Pitt, he was with Jennifer Aniston, so he's in my Jennifer Aniston file. He tried to get out and crawl over and get in my Angelina Jolie file, but she kicked him to the curb. He is in my Jennifer Aniston file. So when you have that thing you can't remember, it's not dementia. Take a deep breath and say to your brain, how did I learn this information? And then leave it alone and the brain will go through the files until it finds Brad Pitt. Now, if you're looking for Clint Eastwood, you should call me because that's a different thing, okay? <laughs> All right, how many of you don't remember names? What a bunch of fibbers in here. You're in a church for Pete's sakes. What's my name? Yeah. Sure, it's written on the screen, it's on your handouts. But the reality is most of you won't remember my name because your hippocampus goes, yeah, we don't need that and kicks it out, okay? Most of us don't remember names. That's not a sign of dementia. That's just how many Johns have you met, sir? How many Bills do you know? Eventually your brain goes, I don't care. And, and it's not worried about it anymore. Does that make sense? Okay. So with age actually comes a thicker, richer brain. Your dendrites become longer. The dendrites in a normal aging 90 year old person, the roots in their brain cells are this long. The roots in a 20 year old person, this one. So two books I want you to get, The Mature Mind and The Creative Age. They are both by uh, Dr. Cohen. He was a neurologist who taught, I believe at Yale Medical School. When you finish reading The Mature Mind, you will walk up to the first teenager you see and kick them in the leg. These are two of the few books written on normal aging brains and you will feel so good when you finish reading it. The creative age is where Cohen describes how all of our greatest works have come from our oldest generation always because it is only with age that you develop wisdom. Have any of you ever been sitting there watching TV and had the sudden thought, that Justin Bieber, he's a wise one. You didn't think that because wisdom is something that only comes with age. Does that make sense? Okay. Stage two is called mild cognitive impairment. It's very slow, it's very subtle, and the person with dementia recognizes that something's wrong, but then they quickly dismiss it. So several months ago, a friend of mine came to the ranch for the weekend, and after breakfast on Sunday, she said, will you test me? She's 52 years old. And I said, test you for what? And she said, I want you to test my memory. And I said, why do you need me to test your memory? And she said, I don't know my pen number, I don't know my mother's last name, and I don't know my daughter's middle name. And I said, how long has this been going on? And she said, seven years. <laughs> and I said, okay, we need to get you into testing here in Austin. And because of your age, we need to get you to a special place that does testing. And she said, yeah, we'll do that later. And that's now been how many months? And in spite of repeated calls, she makes an excuse of why she can't go because it's okay today. <laughs> But at the same time, she has moments where she recognizes that there is something significantly wrong with her. Okay, and when I tried to talk to her friends about this to help her, can you guys have known her forever? Can y'all get together and get her to the doctor? They said, well, why? And I said, because if you don't, she's going to be dead in three years. The younger a person is with dementia, the more aggressive the disease is. But in stage two, 
you notice something wrong with your loved one, but it quickly disappeared. It was just a fraction, just a flip, just a blip. And they quickly corrected and moved on. So you, you didn't say anything. You thought, well, maybe they're just tired today. And that's normal. Everything you've done is normal. Stage three is where the word dementia is now the diagnosis. And your question, of course, is which dementia? Okay. And this person, as a spouse, you noticed something is different. I know this person and they're not the same. And being a good loving spouse, you brought it up and you pointed it out to them. And then they ripped your head off and handed it back to you on a silver platter. And so you didn't bring up memory issues anymore. Stage four is the middle stage of dementia. This is called moderate dementia by the doctor. This is when adult children begin to notice that something is wrong, something is different with their loved one. This person can become easily agitated if I press them to finish a test, if I press them for the answer. They become very, very agitated. They can make bizarre, complex plans for suicide. This man had been the head of his state's child psychiatric department. Brilliant man. The family called me to come see him. I'm talking to him and I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I've got it all worked out. I said, that sounds like you have a plan. He said, I got a plan. I'm getting a round trip ticket. I'm flying to Norway, joining the Hemlock Society, and then I'm going to kill myself. I said, why do you need a round trip ticket? He said, no, I'm going to get a round trip ticket. I'm going to fly to Norway, join the Hemlock Society, and kill myself. And I said, but sir, you won't be coming back in the front of the plane. You'll be in the bottom of the plane. You don't need a round trip ticket. No, I got to have a round trip ticket. So I was like, do you need to join the Hemlock Society? Do you hear how this plan doesn't make sense? Now, if he was telling me, me this plan and the family had said there were a bunch of loaded firearms around, we'd be having a different reaction, okay? And we're in Texas. How many of y'all have guns at your house? So call the sheriff's department and have them come remove the firing pin, okay? If you think moving the guns is gonna cause an issue. They have good social skills. There's still a lot of brain tissue. There's only a couple of ounces of brain tissue missing at this point, but their connections are beginning to be met. But they fool professionals because they don't look sick. They're still driving. Then that scared the crap out of me. I saw two today on my way here. They fool family and they fool neighbors and friends and they're not intending to, but they are easily agitated. Stage five begins and she still doesn't look sick. Stage five is when most people in our country are diagnosed. And at this point on your staging tool, stage five at the beginning, they've lost a half a pound of brain tissue. They now have the equivalent to a 12 year old. Would you let a 12 year old drive you around Austin? Would you leave a 12 year old at home alone to cook their own meals and take care of themselves? Middle of stage five is an eight year old. Would you let an eight year old still drive? You know how many people tell me, oh, he knows just to not leave the neighborhood. Have you noticed the silver alerts? The Amber Alert system is used more for people with dementia who have driven away from their homes than it is for children who've been kidnapped. Okay, you can't trust that this person understands what they're doing. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, and they can't drive. There are major changes now. You're now beginning to see the disease in earnest. You've got to be aware of finances. You cannot let these people have an iPad or have a computer. They will give away the money. The biggest amounts I've seen lost were $8 million. The man who was a university professor who was very renowned had sent over $8 million to another country to a girlfriend. It wasn't a girlfriend, it was a gang. Here in Austin, I knew a family that had saved $135,000, and by the time they realized what the husband had done, there was only $35,000 left, because how much mail do you get that looks like a bill? And this is a generation of people that paid their bills. And so they sit down and write a check to that company, and the next thing you know, that agency is sending them all kinds of stuff about needing money, okay? I know a family here in Austin that didn't want to intrude on their parents. They didn't want to be intrusive, even though both parents were what we would call pleasantly demented. They were in their mid-90s. And by the time they did decide to step in, $4 million was gone from the stock market. It was in the real estate change of 2008 because they didn't want to upset anybody. 
You cannot let them have access to this. They will refinance your home. They will lose all of your money. And there's no going to get it back. Okay, does that make sense to everybody? Do you hear me? Um, this is where they begin to accuse you of theft. How many of you have been accused of theft? You can keep your hands down, but I know all of you have been. You've stolen my purse, you've stolen my wallet, you've stolen my car, you've stolen my bank account, you've stolen my money, you've stolen my house. Okay, now understand in communities, we know you really didn't do this, but we also listen with one good ear because of drug addicted nephew, drug addicted grandson who may really be stealing all this stuff. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, you may see change in sexual behavior. Both male and female brains produce testosterone. And because of brain damage, your loved one's testosterone levels may go off the chart and they may become very sexually aggressive. And the doctor simply gives them an estrogen to rebalance it. Proof that women are stronger. Estrogen beats down testosterone. <laughs> they begin to accuse, um, they, they may even get to the point where they're calling the police and accusing you of stealing from them. So it can be a very serious thing that happens. Late stage five, and stage five is called moderately severe dementia. By the end of stage five, they've now lost a pound of brain tissue. There is significant brain damage. They now are beginning to look sick. They're beginning to move differently. And if they get outside of their normal routine, they are very lost. Sometimes families don't even realize what was going on until you swooped in and took that loved one away for a vacation or you took them home with you for a couple of weeks and you realize once you, re once you remove them from that environment they've been in, they were very lost as to what was going on around them. They still don't look physically sick. They're still accusing you or other people of stealing from them. They tell you the caregivers in the building are stealing from them. And it's not that, it's that I can't find it. And my brain doesn't realize that anything's wrong with it. So my brain tells me that that's where I always put my purse and my purse should be there and my purse isn't here, but Rachel is here. And I've always thought Rachel looks suspicious. <laughs> so I'm gonna accuse Rachel of stealing my purse. I'm gonna upset her and Rachel's gonna leave. And then later, you think I'm asleep at three in the morning, I'm up cooking for a cat that doesn't exist and I find my purse in the freezer and I don't think, oh, I need to call Rachel and apologize. I think, oh, how sneaky Rachel is. She hid my purse in the freezer. She'll be back tomorrow. I better go hide my purse before she gets here. And the game starts all over again. I knew a family once that bought 10 black purses put the same thing in every purse. And when their mom lost a purse, they went, oh, look, here it is. Handed her another purse. <coughs> okay, everybody with me? People in stage five, hunt and gather. This is not a lazy generation, they are busy. How many of you have hunters and gatherers? They go from room to room to room, looking and picking up new places. And if your loved one's not in the right memory care, you'll get a call from that building saying, yeah, your loved one's bothering other people. You need to get a 24 hour sitter. No, a dementia community should know this is hunting and gathering. This is a normal part of the disease and you don't need to care an extra caregiver to watch this. They're just busy. You may not have a hunter and gatherer. How many of you have Goldilocks? Goldilocks goes from room to room to room trying out the beds until she finds one that's just right, takes a nap and she gets up and moves on, okay? She doesn't need a 24 hour sitter for that. That is a normal part of dementia. Does that make sense to everybody? One person said yes, and she's a nurse. Did that make sense to the rest of y'all? Okay. She may be cheating and using her nurse skills. Stage six is called severe dementia, and your person now looks ill. So they go from standing up straight to being bent. They go from walking to shuffling, and the head is down. And now they're doing this, and they're beginning to lose weight rapidly. And the normal weight loss is one third to one half of their body weight as they start stage six, okay? This is the part where we begin to look at finger foods. This is the part where when you come to visit, you need to bring pie, you need to bring donuts. If you bring donuts, you better bring enough for the whole building. People with dementia can smell donuts through concrete walls. I've seen it happen. They are colder than you and I are. Their movement and coordination is beginning to be affected. They are rapidly losing language skills, but they still understand your tone and pitch of voice. Okay. Oh. What does ADL mean? Activities of daily living. 
Okay. Now, the, thank you for bringing that up. The activities of daily living are, this is Dr. Katz's scale, and this was developed in 1953. There is a huge jump from I can do it normally to where the scale starts to count off. So if you're starting to check things off on the ADLs, your person is probably in stage five of the disease. There is such a, a jump from can do it normally to beginning to have issues. And it's simply that this scale has not been updated in 70 years. Might be time to update the ADL scale, but it's what you did this morning, okay? And this is how I remember it. I woke up and I transferred from a lying to a sitting to a standing position. Then I ambulated. Where's our first stop every morning? Well, we're, we're medical professionals, so we toilet. Y'all yeah. go to the bathroom, but we toilet. Then I did my bathing, my grooming, my dressing, my eating. It's what you did this morning. And that's all we do in memory care. Nobody's trying to teach your loved one tricks. Nobody's trying to grow brain tissue. We're simply trying to get them to do their activities of daily living as smoothly, as calmly as possible. And most of your behaviors occur from untreated pain and from a caregiver who is not recognizing that when I do the activities of daily living, this person may be full of arthritis and that knee was replaced, which means that knee was amputated, which means there is certainly arthritis there. And if I'm not paying attention and I hurt Rachel when I move her and she's a fighter, she's gonna hit me. Combative behavior in dementia is untreated pain, untreated anxiety, untreated depression, and an untrained caregiver. Or some of the behaviors are related directly to the type of dementia it is. Everybody with me? Okay. Stage seven is called very severe dementia, and this is also known as the bedbound stage, and most of your loved ones are not going to live to this stage. Only a small percentage of people with dementia live there. And this is person is totally relying upon others for care including being able to turn them in bed. They are not able to walk anymore. They are not able to use speech anymore. Those parts of the brain are significantly damaged. And at this part, they, at this point, they have lost usually a pound and a half of their brain is gone. Okay, yes, ma'am. On your staging tool, it's gonna to tell you stage five is one to three years, stage six is one to three years, stage seven is one to two years. Okay, so every two months, do not read your staging tool every day. If you read your staging tool every day, you will think I've got it too. Okay, read it tonight. Stage your loved one. Understand that I grade harder than you do because I don't have the emotional attachment. I'm looking clinically. They can either do this thing or they can't. Then every two months, come back and look at it and stage them again. And you can see how quickly they're progressing. You can also see what behaviors you'll begin to see next, okay? So draw a line and date it, and then come back every two weeks. And when you read stage two stuff on your dementia scale, you're all going to think, I've got it too. You don't. Each one of those things by themselves is a normal thing. So how many of you have lost your cell phone? Today while you're sitting here? Yeah. Do you know cell phones were going to make your life easier? Did that happen? No, you found out you work for crazy people who send out emails at three in the morning. Are you a bad person if you don't get up and answer the emails right then? Okay, so as you read stage two, don't be concerned. One by one, those are all normal things, okay? Stage seven, the UTI and fall risk actually goes up. The fall risk goes up even though this person is bed bound and can't move and we don't understand that. And this is the point where UTIs follow each other one right after the other. Let's all breathe, feet flat on the floor, hands in your lap. We're gonna do two rounds, deep breath into the count of four, hold for two, breathe out to six. And I can see you, deep breath in, two, three, four, hold, hold, breathe out, two, three, four, five, six, deep breath in, two, three, four, hold, hold, breathe out, two, three, four, five, six. This breathing technique is in your stress tips handouts, okay? All right, we're back to the nine most common dementias. Here we go. The first dementia is mixed dementia. That is actually the largest group of all dementias is mixed dementia. And originally, mixed dementias meant Alzheimer's and vascular disease together. 
And then we begin to realize that if you had any dementia and lived long enough, Alzheimer's would join it. And then it began to re be realized that any dementia could join any dementia. Then it began to be realized that some dementias uh, in the FTDs, the frontal temporal dementias, only occur if another FTD dementia has already started. And on autopsy, the most we found in any person is up to five dementias. So your person may have multiple forms of dementia, okay? And if there's any cardiovascular things going on with them, you need to add in vascular dementia as well, okay? So mixed dementia simply means it's a mixture of more than one form of dementia. Now, you can't see this real well in here. You can see two arrows, but if you saw this brain, this person had multi-infarct vascular dementia, meaning multiple stroke dementia, their strokes were transient ischemic attacks. Those are the ones called tiny strokes, baby strokes, little strokes, pinpoint strokes, mini strokes. This person has over 50 mini strokes in their brain. They develop multi-infarct dementia, lived long enough that Alzheimer's crept in as well. This brain has mixed dementia of Alzheimer's and multi-infarct vascular dementia, okay? Dementias of the Alzheimer's type. There are multiple domains. Early onset is people before the age of 60, okay? Now, about 5% of those, it's hereditary. And of those hereditary early onset families, every one of them came from a valley region of Germany. So there was obviously a genetic mutation that occurred there. There's been a second place in the world found that's in South America, where another group of people in a community all have this same familial form of uh, early onset Alzheimer's. Where did a bunch of the Nazis get away to after the war? South America. So it's thought that there's a connection there. But the bulk of early onset Alzheimer's is sporadic. There's no history of dementia in your family and suddenly your 35 year old sister is diagnosed with it. And the younger a person is, the more aggressive it is. Down syndrome Alzheimer's is the second domain of Alzheimer's. People with Downs are going to develop Down syndrome Alzheimer's and it is very, very aggressive. Regular onset Alzheimer's is people in their 60s and 70s, and it has some subsets. Uh, atypical frontal variant, which is typically misdiagnosed as behavioral variant, FTD, or uh, behavioral variant, oh, it's just misdiagnosed as behavioral variant, FTD, but the, the rule of thumb is the atypical frontal variant Alzheimer's person is losing weight, behavioral variant, FTD, is gaining weight. They gain 30 to 40 pounds in a matter of just a couple of months, okay? Posterior cortical atrophy, this person begins to lose vision. Okay, now these are very rare, but I can name five people in Austin whose loved one had PCA. Then you have variations, and the variations include things like delusion behavior, hallucination. A delusion is a belief that your loved one has that's not real. A hallucination is something they see, hear, or smell that's not real. And then they may have persecutory beliefs. You're out to get them. You're trying to trick them. You're doing stuff to them. And there may be aggression, agitation, or anxiety. But when you go back and look at the variations, these also are all things that come with untreated chronic pain. So if we treat pain every single day, the behaviors in your loved one go down. Then late onset Alzheimer's is people in their 80s and 90s. It has the same variations as regular onset Alzheimer's and another domain has now been added. And one person in their 80s and 90s, I write pleasantly demented. In the other form, I write highly agitated and aggressive. So there are now been two domains identified for late onset Alzheimer's. So some of you have a pleasantly demented 90 year old person. Some of you have a very agitated 90 year old person, okay? Sometimes, and we're always gonna check for pain, okay? Check for pain. So this is a normal brain and then an Alzheimer's brain. On the Alzheimer's brain, everywhere you see dark, there is no more brain tissue there. That is now brain fluid. It's cerebral spinal fluid, okay? That person has lost half of their brain, okay? What your loved one is doing is real, even if they don't look sick yet, and it's all related back to what's happening in their brain. Vascular dementia can be any age group. We've had young people that have had strokes, young people that have blood pressure. In my family, 
my, my mother doesn't actually have dementia. So if anybody runs into Margie, please don't tell her I use her as an example. Um, I was speaking in Temple one time and my parents were builders in that region. And after the conference, 20 people ran up to me and said, oh my God, I didn't know about Margie. Can we call her? Will she know us? What? It was like, oh my Lord, please don't call Margie. She has no idea I do this. So vascular dementia could be any age group. Okay, and in my family, we don't actually develop dementia, but a whole bunch of us drop dead at 40 from vascular disease. I don't have the gene, but my baby sister has been on high blood pressure medicine since she was 20. That's obviously not normal. She would have been the one that dropped dead. Does that make sense? So you inherit vascular conditions. You can be this big around and have high cholesterol because you inherited it, okay? And this is the dementia that we've got medication to stop you from getting. 15 minutes forever? Wow, y'all are tough. Okay, so we have dozens of forms, but take a picture of this. When your loved one has an MRI, you're looking for things like white matter and gray matter. If you have an MRI that uses those two phrases, you've got vascular dementia in your loved one. Okay, everybody with me? I feel like you're with me. Okay. I feel good about it. These are all brains that have vascular dementia. The white areas indicate where there's no more brain tissue. Person A has had a massive stroke in their left temporal lobe, which is formal language. How are they speaking to everyone? Cursing, probably a lot of cursing going on. Is it intentional? No, it's just what they're doing. Lewy body dementia is typically thought of as people between the ages of 60 to 80. Although we are beginning to see people in their 90s, I think in the last three months, I've had seven people in their 90s with Lewy bodies, and we didn't realize it lasted that long. So they have those four hallucinations. They see children, bugs, spiders, rats, and snakes, bad people coming to get me, spouse having sex. They have REM sleep behavior disorder. They have systemized delusions that are typically sexual in nature. And when you hear the delusion, you're gonna think this is just totally crazy because the delusion is typically tied up with what they're watching on the news. So the first time I saw this, the man came to the nurse at three in the morning and said, you have to call my wife. My wife is having sex with the drug cartel. And when they told me this the next morning, I thought, boy, she's tired. He thought the drug cartel was one person. And he knew that tomorrow the police would be arresting everybody in the drug cartel and he didn't want his wife on the news naked having sex getting arrested. The next time I heard this delusion, her husband, her, uh, his wife was having sex every day with Donald Trump on his plane, but he knew tomorrow the plane was going to fall out of the sky and the TV cameras would be there and she'd be naked having sex with him on the ground. And he didn't want anybody to know that because you hear a lot of love in this systemized delusion. And as you break it down, you figure out what part is coming from the news that they're hearing around them. So does that make sense to everybody? Okay. They have trouble with executive function sooner than other forms of dementia. And this is your ability to plan and carry out something. They have trouble with visual spatial function very early in the disease and they begin to fall earlier than other people. So Lewy body people will pull out a chair to sit in, but then not walk in front of the chair, just sit. And that hurts a lot. They have a very unusual fall, that sudden stiffening and falling forward or falling backwards. They have trouble with constipation, both Parkinson's and Lewy body, and it's not related to diet or exercise. It's part of the disease process. They have repeated falls and they have unexplained loss of consciousness. And remember, in Lewy body and Parkinson's, their hippocampus doesn't get damaged until very late in the disease. So they're aware that they have Parkinson's or Lewy body they just don't necessarily are not upset or excited about. They also begin to accuse their caregiver of theft in stage three of the disease. In the other dementias, that's a stage five behavior. This is a brain with Lewy body. Frontal temporal dementias are typically people in their 30s, 40s, or 50s. We're taught that if the person is below the age of 60, we should be looking at frontal temporal dementia first. And there is a separate frontal temporal dementia staging tool in your thumb drive, in your itty bitty book. So if your person doesn't have FTD, don't do that one. But what you want to do is figure out which of the FTDs they have, and then you will follow it down that column. If there is an X in the box, it means that the behavior on the left goes to that form of FTD. Okay, 
When you get to stage six, there will be no more X's in the boxes because at stage six, all dementias are considered the same due to the amount of brain tissue loss. The first two, behavioral variant and ticks, these are the sexual behavioral dementias. The next three, primary progressive aphasia, semantic dementia, and logopenic variant are the communication disorders. And the last ones are the movement disorders. Now, how many of you know Linda Ronstadt? Personally? <laughs> We love Linda, don't we? Linda has prosuper nuclear palsy. And in all the news stories about her, not one single time has it been identified that she has a frontal temporal dementia. Okay, so that stigma of dementia is real. This is a brain with behavioral variant FTD. There is no frontal lobe left. There are holes in the parietal lobe. The temporal lobe horns are gone. The hippocampus is gone. The limbic system is gone, and there are holes in the occipital lobe and the parietal lobe. This is Parkinson's disease. And this can happen at any age, but the older you are when you develop Parkinson's, the more rapidly it becomes Parkinson's disease dementia. Okay? So the older a person is when they develop Parkinson's, the more rapidly it becomes the dementia. And if your person has Lewy body, you're watching for Parkinson's disease dementia. If they have Parkinson's disease dementia, you're watching for Lewy body. It's now considered, these two are considered first cousins of one another. They start in areas of the brain that touch each other. It's thought perhaps this is the connection. This person um, has trouble with speaking. As time goes on, Lewy body and Parkinson's people are very high choke risk, risk earlier in the disease process than people with other forms of dementia. Couldn't figure out what you were doing. She plugged in a computer, totally threw me. Um, and so you have all of this different behavior that occurs in people with uh, Parkinson's. And sometimes it can be difficult to make the diagnosis between Parkinson's and Lewy body. The big trigger is those four hallucinations the Lewy body person has that the um, Parkinson's person typically doesn't. Wernerke Korsakoff syndrome, this is drinking. Now this is not your mamby pamby, I had a drink last Saturday night. This is dedicated drinking. This is hardcore drinking. I asked a guy one time, do you drink? And he said, oh yeah, one a day. I said, one what a day? Case in a bottle. This is drinking, okay? So this is drinking to the point of intoxication. And they have different, a lot of times they're diagnosed, the eyes are different, the eyes move different, they look droopy. This person appears drunk even when they're not, okay? They tend to be more agitated. They uh, also tend to self-isolate in a community. And one out of four of people with Wernerke Korsakoff, one out of four will smear feces as a way to get back at the staff. So if your community has already got some interesting and challenging folks in it, you might want to think twice about taking somebody with Wernerke Korsakoff because this is a very challenging dementia for a building to deal with. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, and if your loved one has this, and if they're like my dad, they haven't drank in 30 years, but before that they were doing both this, um, you wanna make sure the doctor knows about this because there can be a connection. Does that make sense? How many of you are going home tonight to drink? <laughs> Huntington's disease, Huntington's chorea, and juvenile Huntington's. Um, juvenile Huntington's is the one that strikes children. This is passed through the family line. This is one of the dementias that is hereditary. In fact, this is hereditary. The children either have the disease or they're a carrier. Okay. I met a woman a couple of weeks ago in Austin and she said, what do you do? And I told her and she said, have you ever heard of Huntington's? And I said, oh my God, yes, worst dementia of all. She goes, I've got it. I said, you have Huntington's? And she said, yeah, my mother died of it. I don't know if I have it or I'm a carrier, but I'm not going to the doctor. I said, do you have children? And she said, four. I said, you, 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 you need to go to the doctor. You've got to find out. Are you a carrier or do you have it? Because it affects your children's children. Does that make sense? This is a gruesome and horrible dementia. Anybody in here with Huntington's? I do dementias all day long. This is what I do. When I speak to a Huntington's group, I go home and get on my hands and knees and thank God we don't have this. This is a horrible, horrible dementia. And this is one of the dementias that does get antipsychotic medication. Your loved one should not be on Seroquel. 
Okay, the only groups that get Seroquel are behavioral variant FTD and PICS dementia and people with Huntington's. The rest of them are not supposed to be on antipsychotics. So question that. Most of the time, your loved one's getting an antipsychotic and they actually need pain medication. Isn't that crazy? How many of you are pleasant when you're in pain? Chelsea Shauna walk up here a while ago dragging that leg. I was like, how's your sciatica today? Yeah. And then the last of the dementias that we're dealing with is chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is football dementia. By the time, if a young man started playing peewee tackle football, it's estimated that by the time he graduates high school, he's had the equivalency of 3,000 head-on collisions in a car going 30 to 45 miles an hour. Um, we're looking mainly at boys after the 1970s. That's when we suddenly got a bigger group. People begin to grow, bigger guys hit harder. And what we know now is that when they're hit on the side, the brain stem begins to um, shear. You also have a jagged ridge of bone right here called the frontal bone. You have a jagged ridge back here called the occipital bone. And when the brain gets hit, it bounces back and forth between those. And that's why you get so many um, agitated behaviors. This is the only dementia staged in four stages. And obviously there's a middle group coming. So every time I see a professional football player, a college football player, any of those players doing something stupid, ridiculous, assaultive, whatever it is, my first thought is, do they have CTE? Okay. Everybody good? Okay. People with dementia have behaviors. They have all kinds of behaviors, and the behaviors are directly related to what's going on with them. So they have hallucination behaviors, and those immediately begin to make us think Louis body. They have scatological behaviors. Scatological behaviors is feces or urine. So who pees in a trash can? Men or women? Men. Yeah. Are they doing something ugly, or are they just looking for a round hole to pee in? Who pees on the silk plant? Men. Yeah. Men have been taught all their lives, go stand by that tree and pee so no one sees you. They're not doing anything ugly. Somebody gets up on the counter, scooches over, and defecates in the sink. Well, that looks like an outhouse to a person with dementia is what that would be. So you get these behaviors, but there really isn't any smearing of feces on purpose unless it's one of the odd um, Wynerke Corsica. Normally, people with dementia, they feel that they did something. They put their hand behind them. They've got some making on it. They're simply trying to get it off. Okay, they're not trying to do something to make your life harder or the staff's life harder. They have delusional behavior because of brain damage. They believe things that aren't real. You're stealing from them. There um, is a lack of empathy or speech. Those are the frontal temporal dementias because this is where empathy and emotions are. They can be verbally, verbally or physically aggressive. That tends to be vascular dementia people. They can feel their brain's not working and it makes them angry because they can't get that word to come out. You have sexual behaviors that can occur in any dementia because of a sudden rise of testosterone. Your people have falls and UTIs. They have challenges doing ADLs because the staff's not using their first name. The staff's not going slow enough. And if I move your arthritic knee and hurt it, I need to apologize before I move it. I need to apologize after I move it, okay? Um, we have pain, anxiety, and depression behavior. And if you notice, those behaviors are all the same. So the first thing I'm gonna do is check for pain and rule out pain. Then I'm gonna check for anxiety. Then I'm gonna look at depression and try to deal with those behaviors without getting to an antipsychotic. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Untreated pain, you're gonna use something called the PAINAD scale, P-A-I-N-A-D. If you simply Google P-A-I-N-A-D, you will get the PAINAD scale. You're responsible for keeping up with your loved one's pain levels for the remainder of their life, okay? Use your dementia behavioral assessment tool. Check off what you see. Use the FTD staging tool if your person, anybody here with frontal temporal, your person's frontal temporal, you know the website, T-H-E-A-F-T-D.org? Okay. Um, and then call me if you don't understand the staging tool. Tools for measuring your stress levels. And y'all need to get a picture of this because I don't have a handout on this, but these are things you need. You need Zarek's Burden Interview, okay? You need the Geriatric Depression Scale. You're gonna take it yourself and you're gonna take it for your loved one. You want the IQ code. 
IQ code lets you go back as far as 10 years so that you can go to your doctor and say, these are new behaviors on here and this has been going on for this long. You will like the IQ code. The HAM A is one of the anxiety tests that you will use to help the doctor understand your loved one has anxiety. Remember, you're living with your loved one 24 hours a day. The doctor sees them for how many minutes? Three to 10. Great, wow, that's tough. Um, the MM Caregiver Grief Inventory. This measures um, your grief levels, your stress levels, and your mourning levels, how, how badly you're mourning. And the GAD7 anxiety tool is also very helpful. Fill these out along with your ADL tool, your IADL tool, and go back to your physician because this gives them information they understand. Okay? In Austin, doctor whose name I can't remember right now owns self-compassion.org. I want you to go to this website and take the test. It takes five minutes to take the test and what you're gonna find out is you're not being nice to yourself. So here is your actual test today. How many of you are, 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 are caregivers? The rest of you just wandered in for soup. Okay, <laughs> those of you who are caregivers, I want you to go home tonight and write a letter to yourself about what a good caregiver you've been. And your letter needs to start with dear, wonderful self. Okay, this will be a letter you will cherish later on. Okay, and prepare yourself. This is very emotional. Okay, but write yourself a letter about what a good caregiver you've been. Okay?